conserving water, drought tolerant landscaping. Let's see if I've got all of my, so can folks see my screen? Yep. Okay, excellent. There we go, okay. All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Cheryl Lovato-Niles. I'm the water resources educator for WSU Extension in Whatcom County. And um, I have lived in Bellingham since 2003. I moved here for the natural beauty. And uh, my husband and I really appreciated raising our family here. And um, I am delighted to provide some information to you about conserving water because that's uh, something that's uh, important to protecting the natural beauty of this area. And so I'm gonna share 10 tips for drought tolerant landscaping today. And this comes, this is part of an online gardening green course that we offer, um, which is completely free, a self-directed course. And um, at the end, we'll circle back to that again. And, and uh, if anyone is interested in signing up for that, all you need to do is email me. So you won't be surprised to hear that our region is known for our lush green landscapes and for nine months out of the year we barely even have to think about watering anything and then summertime rolls around and we get blue skies and suddenly it feels as though our lawns and many of our garden plants are on life support according to the washington department of ecology up to 70 percent of a household's summertime water is used outdoors so uh, it's not just a feeling, we really do need, we really do use a lot of water in our landscapes. And according to the US EPA, up to 50% of that water is wasted. So uh, if you are part of a water association or you have your own well, then you may have experience with late season water shortages. And if you're on city water, then you are likely familiar with summertime spikes in your water bills. So today we're gonna talk about uh, different techniques for saving water so that you can avoid those late season shortages and those high summer water bills. And so that we can also do what we can to keep uh, more water available in the streams for fish and available for other wildlife. There we go. So the methods that I'm gonna cover can be used separately or together but I would suggest to you that the best methods are gonna be the ones that work for you. So uh, I recommend that you consider your desires for your landscape uh, your, and your own convenience and your own aesthetic choices to help guide you towards what are gonna be the best, uh, best ways for you to conserve water. Okay, tip number one, choose water-wise plants. So, Water-wise, aka drought-tolerant plants, are a great way to save water if you just have plants that just don't need as much water. And there are many great resources for finding plants that are going to fill that bill, and this is one of them, the Great Plant Picks website. So this is a project associated with, uh, this website is associated with the University of Washington, and all of the plants that are included in the databases on this site are grow well in our area, the Maritime Pacific Northwest. They're considered to be easy to grow for gardeners of average experience. They are reasonably disease and pest resistant and they are not invasive. So there is an online search function, function that you can use to find plants based on their size, their sun needs, their soil type, their bloom time whether they have benefits for birds, bees, butterflies, and central to our discussion here, how much water they need. And by the way, um, I can send the links to these online resources via email after the presentation. So you don't need to scramble to write these things down. This is a screenshot of the search function, which shows you all the different things that you can toggle uh, uh, as uh, parameters that you want to search by. And here is a close-up of uh, the, the search function for water requirements. And you can see these last two items here, um, occasional water, meaning every 10 to 14 days during dry weather uh, would be one uh, category, and then drought tolerant once established, uh, meaning water once per month would be another category. 
The website also has helpful lists. Uh, you can see here they offer lists of drought tolerant plants uh, for sun and lists of drought tolerant plants for shade, all broken down by the type of plant. Uh, so vines, perennials, shrubs, etc. This is another nice, nice resource. This is from the Saving Water Partnership in King and Snohomish counties. And this online booklet called The Plant List has short lists of recommended plants for a variety of conditions, including drought tolerance. So sometimes what we're looking for is a shorter list. And uh, this offers that. So here's a screenshot that shows you part of the drought tolerant list. There's additional lists, uh, 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 great native plant choices, ornamental grasses, those we just heard from Jenny. If you were to choose ornamental grasses, it sounds like, you, and you're worried about fire risk, you'd want to get those well away from your home. And then uh, there's also uh, lists of plants that can handle the very challenging situation where you have a very wet area, an area that doesn't drain well, it stays quite wet in the winter, but then becomes very dry in the summer. This is another great resource that I would highly recommend because it succinctly covers a lot of what I'm going to cut, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. And it's available at pubs.extension.wsu.edu. And at the end, there's a some very short lists of drought tolerant plants that will thrive throughout Washington state. And I will just mention to you that all of the publications on the WSU pub site, they're all available for free to download. Uh, even though you do have to click the box that says add to cart, don't be thrown by that. Uh, it's just a formality. They're all free. And so you can use these resources and there are others, of course, uh, to look for native plants, such as this red flowering currant that blooms very early in the season and is incredibly popular with hummingbirds or if you're looking for something that has autumn interest, such as this strawberry tree or an amaryllis belladonna, or if you're looking for something fragrant like a mock orange, or perhaps something that can handle a dry and shady spot, such as this hardy Cranesville geranium. So some things to keep in mind are that even drought tolerant plants need to be watered for the first two to three years while they're getting established. And they may need more water during a prolonged drought period. And some plants that will survive our regular summer drought period won't look their best without some summertime water. So it pays to do your research. And I, I will say that that Great Plant Picks website, they do, they do seem to do a good job of giving you more details about it's drought tolerant, but you know, it, you know, it's it'll look rough if it doesn't get at least this amount of water. So um it does pay to, to, to look into it a little bit further. Tip number two, hydrozone. So hydrozoning just means grouping plants according to their needs for summertime water. So it's a very simple concept, but if you think about it, this principle allows you to meet the needs of your thirstier plants and to avoid wasting water on plants that don't need it as much. So you just think about the plant's uh, sun exposure, needs for sun exposure, right? And, and within each, you know, sun, part shade or shade, then you also think about grouping plants together according to whether or not they can handle really drier conditions or what would be kind of average water or if they need really moist conditions. That's going to let you avoid wasting the water on plants that don't need as much. It's going to let you water in batches. And if you uh, water by hand, uh, it'll save you some time and energy because you can avoid dragging the garden hose around to thirsty plants that are scattered all around your yard. For example, you might want to plan for regular watering, watering in full sun, sun areas or for any plantings that are near the house, any lush plantings that you keep near the house, though, uh, again, if you're concer concerned about fire risk, uh, you want to be pushing those back five feet, as Jenny said. And then you could plan for more limited water use, meaning only during dry spells for areas that are in that part sun, part shade area, or get morning sun only, or where you have drought tolerant plants. 
or and you could plan to provide little to no water for uh, natural forest areas or other naturalized areas with drought tolerant plants. So it's just a just to, uh, some ideas. Okay, tip number three is to water in the morning. The morning is the best time to water because there's less evaporation from sun and wind at that time. Also, if you're using a sprinkler or a overhead, another overhead watering method, then the foliage has a chance to dry out during the day, which for some plants is important because it reduces the chance of them developing a fungal disease. Also, um, it also uh, makes, if the soil has a chance to dry out during the day, it's also a little less conducive to slugs, which could be a concern as well. The second best time to water in terms of conservation or, or you know, losing less to evaporation from sun and wind is the evening. Tips number four and five are to water infrequently and deeply and to check your work. So deep infrequent watering encourages deeper root growth and deep roots help plants access deeper soil moisture. But what does it mean to water deeply? Well, uh, for smaller plants, that's about one foot. And for uh, medium plants, that's about two feet. And for larger plants, that's about three, three feet. That's the root zone. And you're trying to wet the whole root zone. So again, that's going to encourage that deep root growth that lets the plants access the deeper soil moisture. I'm sure you've all heard the proverb, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach a man to fish to eat for a lifetime. Watering like that is kind of like teaching a plant to fish. And when you water in this way, deeply and infrequently, you want to think low and slow, like barbecued ribs. Because after the soil dries out, it can become hydrophobic, meaning that the water won't soak in right away. And when that happens, applying too much water too fast just results in runoff, which we want to avoid. Not only because it wastes water, but because that runoff ca can carry pollutants. Uh, if you're living in a city area where the water uh, runs to a storm drain, uh, runoff can carry pollutants from hardscape and streets uh, directly to our streams and other waterways. So how can you tell if you accomplished your goal of wetting the root zone. So there, you can use a soil probe for this. So about an hour after watering, what you do is you try pushing the probe into the soil. If the soil is quite dry, this will be hard to impossible, right? So you'll hit, you'll be able to push it down and then you'll hit the point where it can't go any further. That's the, that's where the soil is dry, right? If it's moist, the soil probe goes in. Uh, so this slide is definitely not to scale because the soil probes are about three feet long. And uh, uh, I, so a very, an extra long screwdriver could work for um, lawn areas or for small plants. Um, but for, if you wanna check deeper than that, the soil probe is gonna be a better tool. And I picked up one from hardware sales. It was about $30, I think. Tip number six is to use a drip irrigation system. So a drip irrigation is a great tool for applying water slowly, preventing runoff and conserving water in general. And they're great for planting beds because you lose less water to evaporation and wind drift and because they apply the water only where it's needed, which is to the plant's root zone, the plant's root area, right? So. Uh, another great side benefit from doing that is that you're not going to encourage weeds to grow, right? And once you get them set up, these systems can save you time. Now, I will say that I was listening carefully uh, to Jenny's presentation and thinking, how does that, in, how does that recommendation to water the mulch um, when you water the plants, how does that inter intersect with this recommendation to try to keep the water uh, really just to the plants that you want. And I think, you know, I think again, 
when you're thinking about that five foot zone right near your house, perhaps that's how you integrate both of these recommendations, right? So you're taking special precautions in that five foot zone around your house. Um, and maybe you're not having mulch there at all, unless it's like a mineral mulch. So drip irrigation systems uh, can be can be great, but they do have some drawbacks. They are more expensive than a sprinkler or a hose. Uh, they do require some setup and they also do require some maintenance. If you are interested, uh, WSU has a great publication on the pub site that uh, can walk you through the details of setting these up and maintaining them. Soaker hoses are a low tech form of drip irrigation that are pretty straightforward. This is a soaker hose that I happen to have on my in my yard, which stays in the landscaping unattached to anything until it's needed, which is about two or three times a summer. Another great tool is a hose timer. So uh, you can use these with either a sprinkler or a drip irrigation system, and this can make watering more convenient, especially that morning watering. And if you're using drip irrigation or soaker hoses, you, you do still do want to avoid watering sidewalks, driveways, or other hard surfaces. Obviously, that's just going to waste water. And also, that, as I mentioned, the runoff can carry pollutants uh, to, to the storm drains that then empty out that water untreated to streams and other waterways. I see that Jenny's. Uh, put a couple things in the chat, the link to the fire resistant plants book. Thank you. And also the Whatcom Water Alliance is currently offering rebates for Whatcom County residents when they purchase a water sense irrigation controller that is either soil or weather based. Nice. Thank you for that. Okay. Tip number seven. Did you have more that you wanted to say about that, Jenny? No, I just realized that um, this would be a good time to <laughs> let folks know that, um, you know, if you're in Whatcom County and you're interested in uh, purchasing one of those irrigation controllers that monitor uh, your watering based on either the weather or the soil moisture, there's, there's two different kinds. Um, you can get a $75 back rebate. And so I put the link in there. There's other rebates as well, but there's lots of water conservation information on there too. So just wanted to throw that out there. That's great. Thank you. I'll have to look into that myself. It'd be wonderful to get familiar with those tools. All right. Tip number seven is to practice smart lawn watering techniques. So the lawn is the thirstiest feature of most yards. And so learning smart lawn watering techniques can make a really big difference. Uh, fortunately, the basic principles for landscape watering apply to lawns as well. So morning watering is best and deeper and less frequent watering is also best. So just like with other plants, deeper infrequent watering encourages deeper root growth and letting the lawn dry out before rewatering also helps to prevent diseases. Tip number eight, apply the right amount of water to your lawn. Most people overwater their lawns. So lawns, most healthy lawns require just about an inch of water per week, and that's irrigation plus rain when they're actively growing. So how do you figure out how much rain fell that week, right? Um, you need to know that in order to know how much additional water your lawn needs. So uh, WSU has a website, the Ag Weather Net website, which is at weather.wsu.edu which provides precipitation totals for the previous seven days for several locations in the county. So you can see those in green here. And what you wanna do is you wanna look at the summary reports, which are circled here in red. And then you can either scroll down, it's all organized by county, or you can use the search bar, which is circled in red, and put in Whatcom County. 
And that's where you're going to find, uh, when you pull that up, you'll find the seven day total rainfall. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice that the amount of rain can vary quite a bit from location to location. I'm not sure how good the resolution is for this uh, for this uh, zoom for the slide here. But uh, if you can see it, you would notice that the North Linden station got almost an inch more rain than the 10 mile station for the example that I have pulled up. So if you live close to one of these uh, weather stations, one of the sites, then it might be a really helpful tool for you. But if you don't, then uh, this next tool might be a little bit more helpful. Uh, this is the National Weather Service's Advanced Hydrological Prediction Service website. And uh, from here, what you can do is you can choose the tab for precipitation and then the time range, and you can choose for the last seven days. And then you can choose under the product, you choose that you want to look at the observed conditions, and then you can enter an address or location and a zip code works just fine. And what you get is this great map, which shows you how, what the total rainfall was for the preceding seven days. My personal favorite way to determine whether my lawn needs water though, is to use the footprint test. If the grass has some water in it, then it, when you step on the lawn, the grass blades will spring back from your step. But if you step on the lawn and the grass springs back just very, 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 very slowly, then it's probably, it's dry. It, it would appreciate a watering. So I like that method because it's simple and direct and it kind of incorporates the heat that we've had. Um, that's, that's my preferred, but I'm very intrigued to hear about uh, these uh, a potential a tool that uh, is based on the soil, the weather or the soil conditions. So that's very intriguing. Okay, so now you've figured out how much water the lawn needs because you because you figured out how much rain fell, right? And but then how do you know when you've applied one inch? So. We suggest you do a little investigation to understand your sprinkler output. So you can use straight-sided containers, such as tuna cans or shallow cups to measure how much water your sprinkler delivers. So you place six to eight straight-sided containers in the sprinkler zone, you turn on your sprinkler or your sprinkler system, and then you check the containers, You know, set your timer, come back, check the containers in 15 or 30 minutes, and then measure the depth. Then you do some quick math, you calculate the average, and this will give you a sense of how long you need to run that sprinkler or the sprinkler system to apply one inch of water. So you could of course do that every single time you water, um, but also probably much more efficient would be to just do it uh, once or twice, a couple times in the beginning of the watering season to get a sense of how much water your sprinkler puts out in a given period of time. And finally, you can use the tools I mentioned earlier to check your work again. So for the lawn, a, a long screwdriver is going to work well because a lawn's root depth is about six inches. So again, you just push the probe into the soil. You know, you take your fingers, you, you, uh, grip it where the probe enters the soil, right? As far down as it went, you pull it out and you can see how many, how many inches down was it able to go in. And again, about an hour after you've watered so that the water has had a chance to really percolate down in. Um, for lawns, you know, you could also just use a shovel or a garden trowel to visually check the root zone. That would be a little bit harder on the lawn, but the advantage is that you probably already own those tools. Uh, another thing you can do is you can let the lawn go dormant over the summer. So it will go golden and then green up again in the fall. But it's important to know that even a dormant lawn is going to need some water over the summer. You want to water it deeply once each rainless month. And also, uh, FYI, 
weeds that have a deep tap root will have an advantage in that situation because that tap root will let them get down to access that deeper soil moisture. So that's going to be dandelions and the cat's ear, otherwise known as false dandelions. So full disclosure, those weeds are fairly easy to dig out, but um, you should know that that uh, if you do let the lawn go dormant, those weeds will have a bit of a competitive advantage. Another caveat is that uh, dormant lawns don't hold up as well under heavy foot traffic. So if you have an, if any area that's getting heavy use is going to do much better with regular water over the summer months. Okay, tip number eight, mow higher for deeper roots. So longer grass grows deeper roots and that makes it more drought resilient. Uh, we recommend letting the grass grow to three inches and then cutting it down to about two inches. Um, another bonus advantage of doing that is that longer length keeps the soil <laughs> shaded, which then also helps to keep weed seeds from germinating. And removing no more than a third of the total length from three inches down to two inches at a time uh, helps to keep the lawn healthier overall. While we're on the topic of mowing, I just want to put a quick plug in for grass cycling. So leaving grass clippings on the lawn where they can decompose in place returns valuable nutrients to the grass. 15 to 20% of the lawn's total nitrogen needs can be provided just by grass cycling. So this doesn't save water directly, but it does help to keep your lawn healthier and reduces the need for fertilizer applications, which also helps to keep our streams and lakes clean. You can grass cycle with any mower, but mulching mowers will blow the clippings down into the lawn where they won't be as visible. Also, again, following that guidance to cut it from three inches down to two inches keeps those clippings small. And so they, uh, they're less visible. Um, I, you know, I, I realize that that's kind of an aesthetic choice that's not going to work for everybody. Um, if you do end up with lines of the clippings, you could run back over those lines um, with the mower to break them down further and spread them out. But uh, again, that could be an aesthetic choice that doesn't work for everybody. And I just want to mention also, if you are in the Lake Whatcom watershed, you are probably well aware. And as Jenny mentioned, that too much phosphorus is a problem for water quality in the lake. And so you need to know that grass clippings and fallen leaves and any organic material does have phosphorus that can, uh, that can you know, contribute to the problem in the lake via runoff if the material runs off your property. So it's important to sweep any grass clippings up off of hard surfaces and back onto your lawn where they can decompose and those nutrients can be taken up by the grass. Tip number nine is to reduce or eliminate your lawn area. So you could consider saving water and reducing your overall lawn maintenance chores by replacing lawn areas with easy to grow pest resistant drought tolerant plants. So uh, you could consider, you could go big and eliminate all of it. Again, uh, if, if you're thinking about fire risk, maybe you still want to keep some areas to be uh, serving as that fire break, as Jenny mentioned, um, uh, or you could do a front side or backyard makeover, or you could get rid of the lawn where it doesn't grow well, such as on slopes or in shady areas or in places where you just don't use it. And if you live in the Lake Walker watershed, you might be eligible for the Homeowners Incentive Program, which allows you to be reimbursed for projects that protect water quality, including replacing lawns with native plant landscaping. And my final tip, tip number 10, is mulch. The magic of mulch. So a few inches of mulch can retain substantial soil moisture, and it does a lot more in the garden. It is a home landscape workhorse. 
It helps to keep weeds at bay. It improves soil health. It improves rainwater infiltration. It reduces surface runoff. It, uh, it um, reduces the risk of soil erosion. So we recommend a coarse woody mulch. Arbor's chips are an excellent choice. In fact, according to Dr. Linda Chalker Scott, who's our WSU horticulturalist, Arborist chips are the best for building healthy soil. And you can sometimes get them for free. So Whatcom County uh, has a location at 901 West Smith Road where you can get free chips. And there's a new, relatively new service called Chip Drop, which is also available uh, where you sign up to, uh, you put your name into, you sign up, it's an app, I guess you would call it, and you sign up that you would like to have chips. And then uh, arborists get that information that you would like to take chips, and then they uh, will they will dump the chips at your place. So a um, couple caveats with that, you'll, and if you look into it, you'll see you don't have any control over when they deliver the chips or how much they deliver. So you, <laughs> you might get a whole... Uh, a whole truckload, which would be 15 cubic yards. So not for everybody, unless maybe you work it out with your neighbors that if you get 15 cubic yards that you'll be able to split it up. I have personally had 15 cubic yards of uh, mulch delivered to my home and it is a big pile. I used it all, but it's a big pile. Uh, cedar chips are another nice choice. Uh, they smell very nice. People worry that they're going to harm the plants, but this is not the case. Uh, they do not harm the plants. Bark mulch is a popular choice, but it's not really the best choice because it's waxy and, uh, and it tends to become compacted. And so it can actually reduce the amount of water that reaches the soil. It, if you do use bark or you already have, you know, if you if you do use bark, large bark chunks are going to work better than the finely shredded stuff. And my understanding is that bark mulch should be avoided in high fire risk areas. Though so I so I if Jenny, if you have uh, different information, I would love to hear it. Uh, that's correct. And actually the um arborist chips are a great way to go. Okay, super. Yeah. Um, so, there, so there are also inorganic mulches. So organic mulches are excellent for many reasons, but they might not work well in every spot, right? So hillsides might do better with a covering of rock as woody mulches would tend to wash down and that rock mulch would still help to preserve the soil moisture, even though the organic material isn't nourishing the soil in the same way. Um, or uh, if you have a rock garden where you have plants that require good drainage and dry crowns, that might be a better, you know, a choice that you'd want to make there is to go for a mineral rocky mulch. And also, as we talked about earlier, uh, within that five foot zone around your home, that might be the, the way that you can have mulch and be conserving the water, but, um, but also keeping your home protected uh, from, from fire risk. Uh, the Lake Whatcom Management Program, if you look in the stewardship guidebook section, they have a nice list for approved low phosphorus mulch compost and soil products. And you can see their uh, different um, places where you can purchase mulch. So a couple thoughts on how to apply it. First, you want to weed the area where you're going to apply it. And uh, a four to six inch layer provides the most benefits, though so that's exceeding, you know, four inches is uh, is that threshold that Jenny mentioned. So if you're in an area with that fire risk, you want to maybe stick with that four inches. Shallower layers of mulch can actually encourage weeds rather than deter them. So you don't want to go too, too skimpy with it. Also, you need to know that they break down over time. So uh, y it will get thin and you can investigate that. You'll have to replenish it at a certain point. When, when you get lots of weeds popping up, you'll probably have a, a strong clue that it's time to replenish that mulch layer. You can apply or replenish the mulch at any time of the year. 
but this is a nice wintertime project because the garden is usually quite open from November to February, which makes it an excellent time to apply the mulch. And as a bonus, you'll deter that first flush of spring weeds. And uh, another tip is that a pitchfork is actually a really great tool to use for applying mulch. Couple of things to know. You wanna keep mulch away from the trunks of trees and shrubs because having it piled up around the, uh, around the trunk can invite pests and fungal diseases. So uh, you just wanna remember that trees love donuts. So you wanna keep a six inch mulch free zone around the base of trees and shrub trunks. I hope that uh, some of these tips will work for you. Again, I invite you to consider your aesthetics, your site, your lifestyle, and feel free to mix and match these approaches to find strategies that are going to be successful for you and that you're going to be happy with. And if you are interested in learning more environmentally friendly gardening techniques, uh, we do offer a free self-directed online course called Gardening Green, which covers much more than this, including doing a site analysis, understanding and nourishing healthy soils, some maintenance tips. We also offer oodles of extra online resources. And I begin a new course cohort at the beginning of each month. So if you're interested in the course, all you need to do to sign up is to email me and ask. And then I can get that done. Here is my contact information. And I'll linger on this slide for a moment and ask if anybody has any questions. All right. Here is the slide that has all of the resources, oops, too far, that I mentioned. But I am also happy to send that to folks in uh, via email so that you don't have to write it down. And that, that concludes our event this evening. I want to thank you so much for coming and uh, and I hope that this was valuable. <laughs>